All right, I'm back, and here's the second part of our uh, support protection and movement lecture. And this one's going to talk about muscles and um, muscle anatomy, and then how do muscles contract. So we're going to get into a little bit more detail here, and we're going to do this um, with several different things now as we as we progress through the semester. And um, you know, our goal here is to. Uh, to try to learn about some of these things in a little bit more detail. It kind of ties together some stuff we've already learned. Um, and then, of course, again, the whole point of this class, you can build upon this later if you take things like human anatomy or, or some of your other classes. So we're going to talk uh, in this lecture about muscles. Um, so to begin, in vertebrates, you've got basically three kinds of muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle and uh, they have a little bit different anatomy the skeletal muscles are really long so again um, you know we have this idea of cells and and we talked about how cells need to be small and that's true for most cells but we do have some specialized cells that um, are very big and muscle cells are very long and they're multinucleate they've got many nuclei um, you know did they evolve by fusing together other cells? Maybe. Um, did they evolve by uh, just not going through um, cytokinesis? I, I don't really know how they evolved, but the fact is is that they're you know differently shaped than other cells that you're familiar with. Um, cardiac cells are going to be much shorter. They're branched, and they only have one nucleus per cell. And then we also have smooth muscle cells. And so here's kind of just showing you uh, a micrograph of skeletal muscle cells and the uh, nuclei are on the periphery. So these are long tubular shaped cells and the nucleus is it's not like what you're like a sphere like you're used to. And here's a picture of some cardiac cells. And the cardiac cells have some different uh, characteristics that uh, we're not gonna have time to get into but if you get into like human anatomy and that and this is smooth muscle cells just pictures of them um, some differences between these the skeletal muscles are voluntary and so you send neuro, you know, nerve impulses to cause them to contract and they attach to the skeleton they pull on the skeleton so these are used for movement cardiac muscles are involuntary and uh, they're only found in the heart. That's why they're called cardiac. And of course, um, you can't control them. Now you think, well, I can control them. You know, if I get excited or if I, you know, think about certain things, my heart rate picks up. Um, but you're not controlling them directly, right? Yes, you can think about certain things, concentrate on, on something and make your heart rate go up or you can calm yourself down and use biofeedback to make your heart rate go down, but you're sort of controlling your thoughts, which is controlling you know, hormones and things in your bloodstream, which is ultimately just affecting the heart rate. But you can't, you know, you can't sit here and, and think, all right, beat now, beat now, beat. Now. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, smooth muscle is also involuntary. And you find this in like your intestines. So you have peristalsis, where your intestines uh, mix the food and then move it down the intestine. Uh, capillaries, and so the smooth muscle can uh, contract and shut off blood flow or, or relax and allow blood to flow into the capillaries. Uh, the urinary system, um, the bladder and that. Now, again, you know, many of your things are this interesting mix of voluntary and involuntary you know smooth muscle and skeletal muscle so for example your urinary system you think uh you know it's involuntary i can't control it but i can control when i go pee well yes well you know you you there are sphincters at the you know in the ure, uh, urethra that can close off and you have kind of control over that right and and you can uh, if you're trying to hold it in you can concentrate and, and contract that sphincter and, and so you don't let the urine come out but, you know, when you have that feeling, right, like, oh, I got to go, I got to go, what's happening is, you know, the muscles of your bladder, that's smooth muscle, that's involuntary, and there's something triggering those to start contracting. 
and so that's pushing the urine out and that's when you feel that you know that anxiousness oh i gotta go but at the same time you have the voluntary control over that sphincter that you don't let it out and and then you know when then when you're ready to, to go pee then you can consciously relax that muscle and the, but it, you know so it's it's this interesting combination of right voluntary and involuntary uh, that goes on all the time with, with other things other than just peeing. Okay, so we want to talk about how these muscles contract. And let's look at their anatomy real quick. And so this is a figure from your book, <clears throat> kind of showing you muscles at different levels, at different uh, scales. And you can kind of, you know, in your brain, recognize where, how these things are arranged, right? And so... Um, you've got a muscle and then that muscle is made up of fibers and in each of those fibers you've got these bands of muscle cells and so again that muscle cell is not shaped like other cells it's really long and has many nuclei and so you can see you've got the long skinny muscle cell that's bundled with other cells and then those bundles are bundled together to make a fiber and then that all comes together to make the tissue and so then if you concentrate on one of those cells, just a single muscle cell, it also has lots of tubes running in it. And so it's kind of like these long tubular structures. And in those tubes inside the cell, you've got myosin and actin molecules all lying each to, next to each other, and that's called a myofibril. And that's kind of the, the long tube that's inside the muscle cell and so you got many myofibrils that make up a muscle cell and then many muscle cells that go together to make up a, a muscle filament that makes up a muscle right and so what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on that myofibril and we're going to see how that works and how that causes the muscle to contract and so muscles can only contract and relax so they can only shorten and then sort of let go. They only work in one direction. And so when the muscle contracts, it shortens and it's attached to the skeleton, so it pulls on the skeleton. Then to make the muscle go in the other direction, it can relax, but it needs an antagonist. It needs a different muscle to pull it, to stretch it back out, right? And so, you know, if I curl my finger, you know, the muscles on the inside of the finger contract and shorten and it pulls on the skeleton to move that finger. And now those muscles are relaxed, but they don't push back. They're not going to go back to where they started from until the muscles on the outside, these antagonist muscles on the outside, they shorten and then pull the finger straight and that stretches these original, these inside muscles back out. And then when these muscles shorten, then that stretches these outside muscles. But the point is, is that at no point do any of these muscles push. Muscles are always a pull, right? They're always pulling and relaxing and then getting pulled by something else, all right? So to understand how this contraction works, we must zoom in on the myofibrils. Excuse me. And so again, going back to our original figure, we're going to zoom in on one of these myofibrils. There are many inside a muscle cell. There are many muscle cells inside a muscle and so on. And I'm going to back up here for a second. Look, uh, again, study this figure. And you see at the very end of it, they're showing myosin filaments and actin filaments. And you see how there's a bunch of these and they're arranged next to each other throughout this myofibril. All right, so that's what we're going to zoom in on. And so this is another figure from your book, and it's showing the myosin and the actin and how they lay next to each other. Now, we've, we've mentioned actin before. Remember when we talked about the um, cytoskeleton, we talked about actin fibers? Uh, it's the same thing. It's the same actin. It's a protein. These are both proteins. And the structure that we're looking at here is called a sarcomere and so it's a portion of the myofibril and so you kind of study this and see how the actin and the myosin relate to each other 
and see how they're anchored. And so you see you get those actin filaments are anchored. It's what's known as the Z line. And then the myosin fi filaments are in between those actins. And that whole thing from Z line to Z line, that's a sarcomere. And so again, just to get this all organized in your brain, you see where the sarcomere is. And that's what we're zooming in on. We're looking at just one. Of course, there's a bunch of these things in the muscle cell. Okay. And so if you look closely at that myosin filament, it's got kind of a golf club shape, right? It's got a long shaft and then the head. And you can see a whole bunch of those all wrapped together um, with their heads pointing in different directions. And so the myosin filaments are kind of attached back to back and you see the heads are all pointing one way on one side and the other way on the other side. They're pointing in opposite directions and this whole bunch of myosin filaments is organized in between these actin filaments. And so, again, in this figure, we can zoom in on that actin filament. So you see those actin filaments that are on either side of the myosin and, you know, on both sides of the sarcomere. And if you zoom in on that actin, you can see you've got that actin filament, and then it's got another protein called tropomyosin that's wrapped around it. So you've got the actin filament with tropomyosin wrapped around the actin. There's another type of protein that's associated with this called troponin that's sort of attached to the tropomyosin. And so for the muscle to contract, these myosin filaments must slide past the actin filaments. And as they do that, they shorten that sarcomere. But all the sarcomeres in all the fibers all shorten at the same time. And so if they all shorten, the entire muscle shortens, and that's a contraction. And so, you know, you've got thousands of little poles to make one big pole. So, you know, when you contract a muscle, you know, that's a big pole, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands of little of cells and little sarcomeres that are all contracting a little bit, but combined, it's one big contraction. And so again, relate it back to the original figure, all those sarcomeres in all those cells all coordinate to shorten a little bit. Well, that can generate a tremendous amount of force and generate a muscle contraction. And so this figure is kind of showing you these two states here, right? The relaxed state where the sarcomere is longer and then the contracted state where it's shorter. But notice how those myosin filaments are sliding in between the actin filaments and that's how you make it shorter, right? And so when it's relaxed, they're pulled out and then when they slide past, that contracts and this happens on both ends and so that's what happens during a muscle contraction. And so again, see how the myosin is sliding past the actin, but then to get to the first state, to get to the relaxed state, again, they can't push themselves back to the relaxed state. They just have to wait. There has to be a different muscle that contracts that'll pull those sarcomeres back to the relaxed state. They only work in one direction. They only contract. Now, as that myosin slides past the actin, it actually is pulling on the actin. And so the myosin is grabbing that actin and pulling it. So it's like grabbing a rope and pulling it. So it's not just the fact that the myosin slides past the actin. It's actually pulling itself along the actin. Well, this requires energy. This requires ATP. Okay, well, you know that your muscles burn energy. Well, this is specifically what your muscles are doing to burn that energy. And again, relate this back. You know, we learned how, how do we make ATP? We take energy from our food, and we go through glycolysis, and the Krebs cycle, and the ETS, and we use that energy to make ATP. Now that ATP can go to a muscle and can transfer that energy to the myosin 
which allows it to do this pulling. So you see how this is all starting to kind of come together. By pulling on the actin, the myosin shortens the sarcomere. You know, it's just like, again, it's like you've got a whole bunch of these myosins and they kind of grab hold of a rope and they pull the rope, pulls it all in tighter. And so what they're showing you here, in that contracted state, notice how the myosin is actually attached to the actin. So it can pull, right? If you look at the top part in the relaxed state, you see that none of those myosins are attached to the actin. But when you want to contract, they attach to the actin, pull on it, and shorten the sarcomere. Notice how those myosin heads have bent toward the middle. That's how they pull. So that, that head, you know, again, think of the golf club, the myosin golf club, the head attaches and then flexes, and that's the pulling motion that pulls that on that actin fiber and shortens the sarcomere. Okay, so again, that's the big picture how we're going to contract this muscle, but we can dial in even a little further. Exactly how does this, all this work? And so again, figure from your book, and it's got it step by step. So, you know, work your way through this, and I want you to know these steps. So step one is calcium must come in. So again, kind of look at this picture and orient yourself to all the other pictures. Now we're really zoomed in on myosin sliding next to actin. But it doesn't just slide, it's going to grab the actin. And so you see those myosin heads, looks like little golf clubs laying on the side. You see the actin that's got tropomyosin wrapped around it, right? And then you see some of the green molecules here are representing calcium that's coming in. And so when there's no calcium, you'll notice that that tropomyosin covers what's known as the active site. The active site is where myosin can attach to actin. And so on the left hand of this picture, you see there's no calcium. And so the, the tropomyosin is covering up that active site. But toward the right side of this picture, you see that calcium comes in calcium binds to that troponin and it's when it binds to that troponin that causes the tropomyosin to move and when the tropomyosin moves it exposes the active site now myosin can bind to actin and so it's the the influx of calcium that starts this whole process because it causes tropomyosin to move and uncover the active site So where does this calcium come from? Uh, the calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, does that sound familiar? It sounds like endoplasmic reticulum, right? And it's a similar structure. Again, it's probably, you know, it's an example of, you know, you have endoplasmic reticulum, then natural selection tinkers with that, and, and it does a different, has a different function now, and its function is to store calcium. So if you back up again, to our original picture, you can see sarcoplasmic reticulum that's spread throughout the cell, storing calcium. And so then when the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium, that starts the contraction. So what causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium? Uh, a nerve impulse. <clears throat> and so later on, we're going to talk in detail about how nerve impulses work. And so that nerve impulse comes, and the nerve impulse stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the muscle cell to release calcium and that starts this whole process. Okay, so now the tropomyosin has moved, the active site is open. That allows myosin to bind to actin, right? In the relaxed state it's not bound to actin. Now it's going to bind to actin because it's got a place to grab hold of and that's what they're showing you here. Once the myosin is able to grab the actin, then it's going to flex its head. It's going to flex that golf club, right? And so my arm is straight up and down, but this is laying on the side, but you get the same idea. So it grabs and then bends its wrist or bends its head. It bends that head backwards. And as it does so, it 
holes on the actin, right? But it can't just do this spontaneously. It's got to take energy. And so it burns an ATP to get the energy to flex that head. Well, remember, these are proteins, right? We've seen this already. We've seen examples where proteins take the energy from ATP and use that energy to change their shape. That's exactly what's happening here. The, the myosin is not going to change its shape by itself, but if it has extra energy from ATP, that energy allows it to change its shape. But when it changes its shape, it's now bound to actin. It pulls on the actin. That's where you get the pull. That's where you get the force for a muscle contraction. Well, this is just one little molecule doing this, but you're talking thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of these all doing it at the same time. A bunch of little pulls will give you a big pull. Now, once that myosin head flexes, then it lets go. And it's in the flexed state. It's, it's changed its shape to this state. Um, so to let go, a new ATP comes in and binds to the myosin, right? So once it's burned its ATP and changed its shape, then it drops that ATP. When a new ATP comes in and binds to it, that causes it, just by binding to it, causes it to reset its shape to where it started. But also, it lets go of the actin. And so when it lets go of the active site, it springs back to its original position, but it does this because a new ATP comes in. So you see how they wrote it here. They're writing ADP plus P. So that's an adenosine diphosphate plus a phosphate. So that makes an ATP. So that's just another way of writing an ATP. So now the myosin is back to where it started from. It's back to its original position. And so it can grab a different active site, burn ATP, flex, release, spring back, do it again and again and again. But each time it grabs an, an active site, it grabs a different active site that's a little bit further down on the actin fiber. And so if calcium is present, it can do this 50 or 100 times a second. Bang, 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 bang. And so each time that myosin grabs a new active site that's a little further down. So again, it's like you're grabbing a little further down on the rope and you pull the rope and you grab a little further down on the rope and you pull the rope and you grab a little further down on the rope and you pull the rope and you can keep pulling on that rope. It's doing the same thing. It's reaching to a new spot on the actin, flexing, pulling on the actin, letting go, reaching down, grabbing a new, taking a new grip, flexing, pulling, letting go, and so on. You do this 50 or 100 times a second. You can very rapidly pull that actin past the myosin. And you got a bunch of them doing this. That makes a muscle contraction. And so we call this the grab-pull-release model. So each myosin head grabs, pulls, release. Grabs, pulls, release. And it's like a ratchet. It's like chick, 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 chick. And it just pulls that myosin past the actin, lets go, pulls again, pulls again, pulls again. You do this very rapidly, that's how you can shorten that sarcomere and shorten the muscle. That's a muscle contraction right there. That's how it works. As each of the myosins does this, the sarcomere is shortened. And so it's a whole bunch of little pulls, but pulling together, it's one big pull. So again, in summary, You've got a nerve impulse that stimulates the release of calcium inside the muscle cell. That calcium binds to the tropomyosin. Specifically, it binds to troponin on the tropomyosin. But it causes the tropomyosin to move off the active sites, to uncover the active sites or the binding sites. This allows myosin to bind to actin. And when it does so, the myosin flexes. It, when it flexes, it pulls on that actin fiber, and then it releases. And this is the grab-pull-release model. 
but this requires ATP to cause that myosin to change its shape, which is the flex, which pulls on the actin. Many rapid, small contractions or small pulls it gives you one big pull very quickly. Now, once that sarcomere is contracted, it'll stay contracted until a different muscle somewhere else on the skeleton contracts and pulls it back to its relaxed state and then you can go again. But of course this happens very fast, right? You know, I can contract and release these muscles, you know, this is these chemical reactions occur very quickly, right? And so it's, it's you know, you can make this happen very quickly. But of course, as you make those muscles contract, every time you're burning ATP. And so that's why, you know, if you exercise you burn a lot of energy, and so then you need to eat a lot, and if you don't eat a lot, then you use your energy stores and so on, and you can see how this is all kind of relates together. Okay, um, so the last thing I want to leave you with is there's some different general classes of skeletal muscle, and I just want to mention this because I think it's, it's interesting. First off, you've got what we can call slow oxidative, and so these are slower contractions, now it's relatively slower, right? They're still, you know, this is these are slow oxidative muscles here, and so it's still really it's chemical reactions, but relatively slow compared to other muscles. Um, but you can keep this up over a long time. They don't get fatigued very easily, and that's because they have lots of blood, lots of myoglobin. So it's a uh, you know it's a type of hemoglobin that you find in muscles lots of mitochondria. These are built for aerobic metabolism, right? These are muscles that can make a lot of ATP and use a lot of ATP, but because of all that blood and myoglobin, they have a red tint to them. And so this is red muscle or dark meat. And so this is why it's interesting. If you think about um, when you like look at other animals, but especially if you eat other animals, you know, some animals taste good to us and some don't, and some parts of an animal taste good and some don't. So you've got, you know, chickens, you've got dark meat and white meat, right? Or some fish, you've got, uh, uh, you know, different colored fish fillets that some taste good and some don't taste good. Well, this is one of the reasons. It's different types of muscle. And so in this red muscle, you've got lots of blood and myoglobin that's going to have a different flavor but that's because these muscles are for different have you know have a different function now you've got another type of muscle called fast glycolytic and so these are for relatively fast contractions but they fatigue quickly so, you know you, you can't keep them up for a very long time because they're anaerobic right so they're glycolytic they can do glycolysis and produce a little bit of ATP, but they don't produce a lot of ATP and lactic acid builds up in these. And so these are like what they call fast twitch muscle fibers or sprinters muscles. Well, because they don't produce a lot of ATP, they don't have a lot of blood or a lot of mitochondria. Um, and so they're white muscle. And so again, they've got a different function. These are for, like I said, sprinters muscles, whereas the red muscle is more like marathoners muscles. These are muscles that you can't keep contracting, they fatigue very quickly, but they're much faster, and so they're for much faster movement. Well, again, if you think about like eating, you know, the white meat of chicken or a lot of fish are mostly white muscle, and so it, it's got a different flavor, right? Um, a lot of times people say these don't have a flavor because they don't have a lot of these, those strong flavored molecules in them, and so, you know, a lot of times they say, well, what's it taste like? Oh, it tastes like chicken. Well, that's because chicken tastes like everything. Like, it's more about the seasonings you put on it. They don't, doesn't always have a very strong flavor itself. A lot of fish are that way, too. Then you've got fast oxidative, right? It's like the slow oxidative, but faster, which makes sense, right? And so it's got a lot more of the blood and the myoglobin and the mitochondria. Um, a lot of those things... Um, but they can, the muscles can move faster. So you can have a faster muscle twitch, but you can sustain it. And so things like the, the wing muscles of migrating birds, you're going to see pink muscle. And so it's kind of a little bit halfway between the white and the red. But the important thing is, is that these are faster muscle twitches, but you can sustain them. And so sometimes you see, like, like I think maybe it's like a tuna, you know. If you think about a tuna compared to a catfish, if you eat fish, 
right? They, they look very different. They taste very different. Well, it's different types of muscle. And so that's kind of what I wanted to point out is you've got these different types of muscle. They still do the contractions in the same way, but it's a lot of the other stuff that's in the cell that can give them different flavors. So anyway, I think that's interesting. Okay, so again, we're going to start diving deeper into different things, you know, as far as animal anatomy and physiology, so we can learn about them a little bit more deeply, but also because they, they bring together a lot of the stuff that we've been learning so far. And so that was the goal for learning about muscle, uh, um, muscle contractions in more detail. So um, let me know if you've got any other questions. And that's all I've got right now, so I'll talk to you later. See ya.